so today uh, we're going to talk about uh, test driven development basically um, i've been doing tdd for a while um, i started working with a team who were writing unit tests and then slowly got exposed to this idea that maybe if you write the tests first magic stuff happens and you see people talking about this a lot uh, you know at different conferences and um, meetups like this by the way the chat is working and i'm going to keep a little eye on it so do ask things as we go uh, we might answer things at the end but if there's something that's unclear just ask in the chat and about 20 seconds later i'll spot it um, so just to recap what tdd is it's the idea that you're going to start everything you do by writing a test and which is counterintuitive but when you write that test it's going to fail you're then going to write some code that makes the test pass and then you're going to refactor it you're going to improve things for me the big benefit of tdd is that you start by thinking about tests writing a test you're thinking about design so you're thinking about what's this thing going to look like from the outside How, what's the api going to look like what what What's it going to do? How's it going to behave? Then you do the coding, which is problem solving. You know, I've got a failing test. It's nice. It's like coloring in, it's like paint by numbers. It's like I've got a failing test. All I have to do is think of the algorithm that's going to pass the test. So it's very much like a problem solving mode. I'm not thinking as much about external design and I'm not thinking that much about internal design either. Um, I'm just trying to make the test pass. And then I get this sort of luxury of a refactoring phase where I get to look at what I've done and think about how I improve it, but it works. And improving working code is always a lot easier than improving horrible broken code. So why don't people do it more? Well, I think one of the reasons is it's hard to see how to do it. Um, in, in talks, you often get examples like this, you know, numerical things, I'm guilty of doing a lot of prime number stuff. Um, and they always seem like a bit of a toy example, a bit of a sort of contrived thing. And the questions are normally like, in the real world, what do you do? Um, how do I handle all that user interface stuff? How do I handle all that data stuff, uh, other services I have to talk to? So we don't have like loads of time, <laughs> but what I'm gonna hope to do with this talk is to show how a TDD approach can be used through your whole architecture by giving through example. Um, now to borrow a bit of some concepts from behavior driven development, um, I want to talk about rules. So the behavior of your system can, is really what, what are the rules of the system? So this idea of a rule is like what can what can be done in your software what can't be done what things cause other things those are the rules and those are the things that pretty much are implemented in the system they're the algorithms that drive the system so part of what we have to do as developers is understand what the business rules are meant to be and then translate them into code uh, we have this idea of a feature that i'm not going to dwell on and you can just think of a feature as like a unit of deliverability so it's what set of rules have to be delivered together um, for, for, the, for it to have the impact that we want. So maybe if we let people write checks, we also have to, you know, you can write a check and then that's like money, that's a, that's a rule. We might need to also implement the rule that the check is only like, you can only write a check for the amount of money you have in your account. <laughs> um, yeah, so what, which chunk of things need to be delivered together? Uh, so a feature has many rules. It's nice to keep them small because then you can deliver more regularly. And then a rule would have a set of examples attached to it. And this is the BDD core concept is that you talk about the behavior of the system through examples. There's a format for it. There's a conversation format, workshop format called example mapping. I'm not gonna go into the detail of how you actually run that session, but let's look at the kind of outputs. We've, we've been talking to a business stakeholder about what the system should do. I'm going to build a feature called placing an order. We talk about two rules. Items are aggregated in the order and the order can only be submitted if not empty. So those blue things might look familiar. It's the sort of things people write in tickets, right? It's generic. Um, it covers lots of different cases. 
And then what we can do collaboratively is try and come up with some examples of what would happen in a specific situation. So items are aggregated in the order. I don't really understand what that means. If you add a burger, it says burger times one. Okay. If I add a burger, fries, fries, it'll say burger times one, fries times two. So there's a typo there, but don't worry about it. That happens in workshops. Um, so now with those examples, I kind of I get what the feature's about. So generating them is pretty simple. The order can only be submitted if it isn't empty. So an empty order won't submit. And if I add some fries to an empty order, then it will submit. Very simple. So this is a useful practice anyway to understand features, but then they're going to drive acceptance tests. You can turn them into acceptance tests. You can turn them into offline acceptance tests. So you can write this stuff down and call it an acceptance criteria if you want to. Um, you can stick it in JIRA or whatever. But the important thing is, you know, you can write these after you've had the conversation, you can write out a sentence. So if our system works, then we're going to be able to add a burger and it will be on the order. And if I add burger and two fries, it will say to it'll aggregate the fries. This is very simple because we've only got 45 minutes to go through the whole stack. Um, so if you think about the, the end user, they're, they're someone who wants to order a burger. Right? Um, they have two kind of ways of interacting with the system, two um, use cases, I guess, right? They're gonna, they need to have a way of adding an item to the order and they need to be able to submit the order. And if they can do those two things, we can implement the feature. Uh, you can just sort of look at, look at the feature and figure that out. And those will be exposed in some sort of services and then behind it, there'll be some sort of model of the system. Uh, so I'm gonna show a fairly decoupled architecture because it's the most interesting to talk about different types of tests. Um, so if you think about how a user is gonna add an item to an order and submit an order, they're not gonna be calling services. <laughs> they're not gonna be calling methods on services. Um, it'd be great if they could, if we could directly call PHP methods, that we'd all enjoy that. But really they're gonna to have to go through a load of stuff um, to move their arm and click on the mouse that sends a signal to a browser that runs some JavaScript maybe, that um, maybe talks X and HTTP to a web framework. And then that calls the services for them. So that they're like puppeteering this big chain of things. Um, and then there's a bunch of infrastructure underneath the domain model that is needed to, to do things like persistence. This is persistence is a good example, but other things like job queues, um, other services that provide different functionality that you don't want to build into your core domain. So there's all this stuff, and if we if we do our acceptance testing the way a human would, like we click on stuff, um, we click on stuff in our browser. If we're testing that way, then where is the rule actually implemented? Should hide my beer. Um, rule could be implemented in the JavaScript. The rule could be implemented in the PHP, in the domain model. Or the rule could be implemented in the persistence layer. You could have a trigger or something like that. And that might not be what you want. It might be that by choosing your testing strategy, you'll be able to enforce some guarantees about where your architecture rules are implemented. So the reason I'm showing a decoupled architecture is that I'm pretending, <laughs> but it's really important to me that the rule is implemented in the core of the domain model. That might not be the case. So you might be working on a system, some rules, it might be fine for them to be implemented in the, in the browser. Um, but hopefully you'll be able to see how the same principles will apply in that case. So in my system, an old fashioned PHP system where the you know, the back ends, the, the king. If I apply acceptance tests to the core, that's gonna have a big benefit that I'm gonna know that the business rules that I care about are implemented in the core. It's also gonna help because there's less stuff to worry about when I'm building things. 
if you're using a framework that has a tightly coupled data layer, you might not be able to do this, but it might not be a problem. So it might be fine. You might be fine if stuff is um, implemented either in the PHP or in the data layer because it's not like trusting the browser. In that case, maybe you'd test the whole stack with the acceptance test. We're going to say, I want to test just this bit. So start by acceptance testing at the service level. We're going to fast ish. Um, the aim isn't for you to read and under, read and understand all of the code. It's more to get the feel of the process. So I'd start by making a service test. And I'll, I'll, I'd, I'd make the test first, obviously, but I'm just going to show you where, what objects they correspond to. And let's put it in a folder called application. I'm not that tied to the naming strategy. You can call it services or application services. The idea is that services are what everything else that is outside, <laughs> they're what's exposed to the outside world to call. And I'm going to use the Symphony kernel test case because that will let me keep my services in the test container. You don't have to. Um, you could instantiate them all in the setup, but um, I assume my services are going to have some dependencies. So what's the actual test going to be? Well, we had a sentence from earlier, make a new order, add a burger, check it's on the order. So that's a really good place to start with an acceptance test. Because you can almost read the test back to someone in the business and they remember it's what we were talking about. So here's an acceptance test. And so I, I start by writing this test. There's no service yet. It doesn't have any methods. I'm just trying to think, if there was a service like that, what would I want it to look like? So I'd like to be able to create a new order. I'd like to be able to add an item to the order. I'd like to be able to list the items in the order and get this array of stuff back. Uh, and that's the test. Um, there's a particular style I'm using here. Firstly, I'm trying to limit, or limit the amount of objects. I'm trying to not use anything from the domain model here trying to use scalars. If it's really complicated, you could maybe define some DTOs that belong to this application service. Um, but everything is really just scalar values because I don't want the things calling the application to have to know that domain model. Also, everything here is stateless. So there's an assumption that maybe the create new method might be called, and then sometime later, the add item method might be called on a different process in a different process, different machine. Because we know that this might be implemented as a web shared nothing architecture, PHP web app. Um, or you know it might be a console command where I'm running separate commands. Um, so each of these things is returning an ID that's then passed into subsequent calls. God talking about that for too long. Um, so obviously this test fails because none of this stuff exists. It doesn't even fail really. It kind of breaks dramatically, PHP breaks. So I can get it into a failing state by just making the object um, and giving it enough stuff that the, the failures are more logical failures. You know, if the test says this is what will come back, but an empty array came back instead of syntax errors. So that's the acceptance test. What do we do next? We TDD, the domain model, and other stuff. So it's quite normal to have a failing acceptance test for a long time. What we're going to do is have a failing acceptance test, write a failing smaller test, calling them micro tests because people argue about what unit tests are. So a micro test is any small, tiny little quick to run test. Um, and probably it's. If they're small enough, they're probably only comprehensible to developers. So the micro tests are probably things run by the developers. So I'd write a failing micro test and then make it pass, but then the acceptance test, test hasn't passed yet. I have to make some more objects, give them more responsibilities, do more stuff. So eventually at some point, the acceptance test passed because I made enough objects. So you can see there's two cycles going on. So we're doing the TDD cycle, um, but we're at a different stage of the cycle for each type of test. But I still know what where I am. 
I'd normally would run the acceptance tests separately uh, at the terminal. I'd like run micro tests and and acceptance tests, or you can have a make file, or you can configure your IDE to do it for you. But so you always know. Well, I haven't passed the test. I haven't passed the acceptance test yet, but all my micro tests are passing. And you get to a point and you say, "Okay, my acceptance test is passing." So I write another acceptance test. Let's see how that feels. So I look at my service test and think, well, what does create new have to do? I've only put a dummy in so far. It's going to create an order and it has to return an ID. So it's going to ask the order for the ID. And the order is going to be part of my domain model. So the application is going to use, the application service is going to use the domain model. <clears throat> it's not going to expose it higher up. So I'll, I'll write a test, but there's not much to talk about yet. Um, you don't even need to read that. It's got an ID, <laughs> it has an ID setter and getter. It's a worthless test really. Yeah, I, I often might defer writing that to later. But I won't show you the implementation of order. It's obvious. And then that's not gonna be enough because the ID is null. Um, so I've made the decision early on that the ID is not the responsibility of the order entity. Now, you can obviously use UUIDs or something like this, but, but we're in that sort of scenario where it's the database's job, mostly to make it more interesting. So I have to introduce to the service the idea it depends on some sort of repository, an order repository. And because I'm showing lots of objects out of context, I'm erring on the side of having loads of suffixes on everything. <laughs> I know there are some naming arguments, but the order repository interface and the service is going to be constructed with a repository. And then after creating the order, it's going to add the order to the repository. Uh, and as a result of that, the order is going to have, a, have an ID. So we've, we've got, we've, our acceptance test is still failing because this thing doesn't exist. So we need to generate a repository. So we're going to TDD the repository. It's not going to be the doctrine repository because I don't want to start thinking about databases. But we'll make we'll make a version of the repository and we'll call that a fake. Now, fake is really useful in a situation where you have a fake versus a mock. So instead of using a test framework that's mocking functionality, a fake is really useful if you want to have a version of a dependency that behaves the same way as the real dependency without you having to spell it out using mocks every time. And that's normally the case where it's a kind of driven dependency or a downstream dependency. It's a piece of infrastructure that only exists because your domain model needs it. Right? It's not calling domain model. It's not a peer. Uh, it wouldn't exist if the domain model didn't exist. Like this repository. Um, so we're going to TDD it. I'll probably keep it here. So I'll make an infrastructure fake folder and have a mirrored folder on the test, but then we'll have the interface that it implements being part of the domain model. There's a little imbalance there, isn't there, that hopefully we'll fix later. Um, so I write some tests for the repository. I know one thing it needs to do already. Um, like I can, I know that I have to have this method as part of its interface. And what test would I write? I could write a test that just adds an order and nothing happens, but that feels a bit weak. And in fact, PHP unit will mark that as a risky test. But thinking about it, there is some behavior I know. Um, it gives an ID to an order. So if I, that's what the test here is saying. If I give, if I, if I call add on a repository with an order, then the order will now have an ID which is pretty trivial, <laughs> but it makes me make the repository. I have to write an add method that returns a, no, it does, sorry, it doesn't return an ID. It sets the ID on the order. And I do it a nonsense way. I'm just gonna keep them in an array in memory. And you know, I'm counting the size of the array, so it'll increase. That's good enough for now. And that's it, and that's really it. <laughs> 
Um, so we're going to do the same thing working through the rest of the acceptance tests. So, so far I've got a failing acceptance test. I've got a unit test for an order entity and I've made a start on the order entity. And I've got one unit test for my order repository and I've made a start on the order repository. So let's keep going. The next thing the service does after it creates new is it calls add item on the service. So add item is gonna get an order from the repository, add the item to the order, and then update the order. So I need to add a get method to the repository, an update method to the repository, and an add method to the order, but maybe it doesn't have to do anything just yet. Because there's not really, I can't think of a test that I could write about add yet. So but there's loads of stuff I can add to the order repository. It finds an order that was saved. So if I save an order, if I call add, and then I call get with the same ID, then I should get a, a similar object back. So if I save it and then pull it back out again, I should get the same thing back. Um, if I get an order that doesn't exist, so I'm, I, generally, Everything should kind of be driven by the acceptance test, but you'll think of edge cases that aren't in the acceptance test and you should, you should write micro tests for them. If it's something super business critical, you should go and have a conversation about how, what the behavior should be. But a lot of the time we're just trying to, a lot of the unhappy cases, the things people should never do aren't things that are gonna come up in conversations or be in your requirements document. So it throws an exception when getting an order that doesn't exist. And it modifies an order that's updated. So if I put an order in the database and then I modify it and then I save it again and I get it back from the database, then the, more, the update work. We didn't get a key collision, anything like that. So I'm not going to, I won't show you the implementation of this in the fake, but this is all just array stuff that we're doing in the fake. The code is all on GitHub and all. There's a link at the end. So after this exercise, We've got a nice interface for our repository. We've kind of derived from how the service is using it. So when we implement the actual repository later, we, we know it has to have these methods and it'll slot right in. But, the, but there's more to it, isn't there? There's, there's behavior. This is what I mean about it being a driven dependency. There's behavior that we feel like every implementation of this should have. And that's captured by the tests. Every implementation should give the order an ID when it saves it. Every implementation should throw an exception if you ask for something that doesn't exist. Every implementation should be able to update stuff. Which is different, right? Some other interfaces, it, it might you might not have any requirements. Like if you think about uh, something that recommends, I'm talking about food ordering, something that recommends dishes to people, you might not have any requirements. All you know is it just returns an array of orders because it's off somewhere else. It's some magic you know, machine learning thing, which is much more like traditional stubbing. You'd say, if the recommendation engine returns these things, this is what we should do. So you're more thinking like, what could it throw at us? Whereas here, these tests are about, here's some behavior that it has to have. And the last bit, the order has to be able to list items. Oh, sorry, the service has to be able to list the items in the order. And then we, inside the service, we do that by loading an order and asking the order for stuff. And the service's job is to map whatever format the order entity uh, returns these things to, to what the service contract is. So here we're just changing, manipulating an array. And so this will still fail. I need to make the order have that functionality. So if I add fries to an order, it should return an array saying it's got one set of fries. And then the acceptance test passes, hooray. So we've, cut, we've driven out a handful of domain object tests, a handful of repository tests, which I know at the moment <laughs> might feel a bit of a waste of time, but they'll come good at the end. And we've, uh, we've passed an acceptance test. So we know the core of our 
system implements a rule. It's a good time to commit. Look at the clock. If it's time to go home, go home. If it's half an hour till you go home, go make a coffee and go home. Otherwise, let's do the second acceptance test. So the second one was, if we add a burger and fries and another fries, it should say two fries. So when I write the acceptance test, the interesting thing is that there aren't any new methods on the server. So when you're introducing a new concept, you have to add a lot more stuff. When, it, when, you, when you're adding just like another variation on what should happen. Uh, I, don't, I haven't had to add any new methods to the service. These all exist already and they auto completed and all that. If this will fail, what will probably happen is it'll say cheeseburger one, fries one, fries one. So we need to look at now into the system, you know, which the service doesn't work. The acceptance test tells us the service doesn't implement the rule correctly, but we know which object's responsible for that. It's the order object. So we can add an extra test to the order object, modify the order object's code, and then both of our acceptance tests are passing. We've got this stuff that we've built. So we've got two sets of tests. We've developed two acceptance tests that apply to services and they execute relatively slowly. They're still PHP only. They're still just running in CPU, not hitting disk particularly. The only thing they're doing is they're booting the Symfony kernel each time. That's the main reason for the slowness. Um, and then we have these micro tests, which are some like traditional unit tests for the domain model and some unit test like things uh, for the fake infrastructure. This is pretty fast. This is the sort of thing where you would run it every time you hit save almost. Um, and you'd, you'd never sort of think, oh, I can't be bothered running the test. You, you, you can set up things to automatically run it every change, that kind of thing. So maybe that's the whole feature. Let's imagine that's the whole feature, those two acceptance tests. There were four originally in the example map, but let's move on. Um, so I know, I, I know now that the rule is implemented inside my, the core of my system. Now I could, in some cases, make a pull request and de deploy that if it's something that isn't modifying existing behavior. But probably I'll want to hook it up to the real database and hook it up to the real user interface. And which one are we going to do first? Well, if we do the user interface first, it won't work because we're not really persisting the data. So let's, let's look at the infrastructure layer. So the thing we're going to do is we're going to reuse our contract tests to TDD the real infrastructure. So we've got this structure at the moment with fake order repository, and that contains a lot of useful tests. We're going to quite a, you know, we've got a nice interface in our core domain, so it's obvious that we can create a doctrine implementation of that interface and write tests for that as well. Write the test first, of course. So if I look at the fake order repository, which bits of it are specific to being fake? Well, it's really just the setup. The setup's instantiating the real order repository. Everything else, you, you'll notice the, the um, property is typed. It's typed as, a, as the interface. That's deliberate. It means that all of the tests are only interacting with it through the contract, through the interface method, through the interface methods. Um, so my PHP doesn't really enforce that well, but my IDE will tell me off if I call any methods that aren't part of the interface. Or static analysis tools will if you run them on your tests. Um, so I can take all those tests and put them in a trait. And then a trait won't really have any evidence about which implementation it's designed for. It, everything is just referring to the interface. Um, so maybe I put that trait symmetrically with the interface in my um, file structure, just because that will make me happy. 
So what we've got is a the, the idea that we've got reusable tests that we're, we're going to apply to our doctrine implementation, but also could apply to any future implementations. If we make a web service storage version of um, the order repository, if we start storing our orders in like a third party fulfillment system, we can use the, as well as reusing the interface, we can apply these tests to the other, to the new implementation. So let's look at the doctrine order repository test because that's the first thing we'd, we'd write, of course. So it uses the trait and then I have to think, how am I gonna get my doctrine repository? Well, I'm gonna use the kernel test case again. Um, you can try and do it without, but I think I've seen Jakob do it without it. <laughs> but really, if it, it's gonna depend on the doctrine entity manager, which you want to be configured properly and have all of its connection stuff set up. So the setup is really just getting my order repository and also getting the entity manager just so that we can close it in the teardown. This is what I'd say any questions if people are live. I can't see any in the chat. But the only tests we've got in there are the ones from the trait. Now, if I think of more things I want to test about the doctrine implementation, I, I should think about whether they're doctrine specific. So, you know, if I think of some test that I want to test some edge case about the unit of work, I'd put it in this class. If I think the fake should do it as well, I would put it in the, in the trait and then make the fake do it as well. And then the order repository, you don't really need to see. Um, it's pretty easy to, given those three methods, it's pretty easy to implement them in doctrine. Oh, I've just seen a question. Barney says, why is the entity manager nullable? Um, because I set it to null in the teardown as a, to free up the memory. Sorry if that was ages after you asked Barney, but it's a good question. Um, so implementing the entity, uh, implementing the doctrine version of the order repository isn't what it talks about, so don't worry about it. But I just have to say, well, how do I add an order to the database using Doctrine? How do I get an order from the database using Doctrine? How do I make sure if it isn't found by Doctrine, the right exception is thrown, et cetera. That isn't the hard bit. The hard bit is, it's actually really easy. You know, I've just made a test using this trait. I've got four failing tests. I've written an implementation. The things that actually take up the time are getting Doctrine sorted out configuring the database connection, writing mappings, figuring out how I'm gonna have a test database and fixtures, but none of that's testing, <laughs> that's, that's solving. None of those are test challenges really. Um, the way I normally manage the database is to have that outside of the test tool. Um, delete the test before every execution, that kind of delete the database before every execution. But the point is, I'm not thinking about, I'm not writing any tests during this phase. I'm separating out the thought process in the same way that the TDD cycle I mentioned at the start separates out the three things you're worrying about when, when building software some, somewhat. This kind of approach, I've done all my TDDing, I've done all my test driven development of the fake order repository, got all that design out of my system. Now, um, implementing it for doctrine, I'm really just filling in the, the blanks in the design and trying to remember how the hell doctrine works. Um, if you're on the Symfony developer Slack, you'd have seen me asking some questions to write this code. <laughs> so now we've got two acceptance tests that take some time. We've got nine micro tests that take a lot less time, but now we've got this doctrine stuff that takes much longer. I mean, it's taking much longer than the acceptance tests. Um, that's with SQL light. It would be more like seconds, whole seconds, if you can imagine tests taking that long. Um, if I was, you know, connecting it to MySQL. So this is a, a difference between the acceptance tests and
sorry, I'm reading a comment that's really bad. Um, so you've got the acceptance test and the micro test that run super fast and have no dependencies. And you have the doctrine infrastructure tests that run, uh, they're okay in SQLite, but you have to worry about having a database. So I have to install MySQL, uh, well, Postgres probably, or get a container running, all that stuff. So it starts to be a divide. Probably the acceptance and micro tests I'm running all the time. Probably the doctrine stuff I'm remembering to run before I do a pull request, or maybe just letting the CI server do it. Unless I'm working on that repository, they're not going to fail. So by having the, the same tests aligning the fakes and the doctrine stuff, it lets me not run the doctrine stuff very often. So I'm, I'm, I'm running it with the fake infrastructure, and then every so often a test somewhere reminds me that the doctrine stuff is working the same as the fake stuff. Um, a nice place to run the acceptance and micro test, the fast test with no dependencies, is in your Docker build. Um, that's, that's something I started doing recently, and it, it's, it's nice to not be able to build the container if there's a failure. Of course, that can't depend on any external infrastructure. So that's the infrastructure. Let's look at the UI. How do we build the UI that's going to connect the person to the services? Well, we're going to need to write a user interface test. You could rename your controller folder user interface if you wanted to ha have everything line up. I do like everything lined up, but I thought it might be too much for this uh, talk and it's not a folder structure talk. So we're going to need the kernel, we're going to need a controller. The point is we're going to use our acceptance tests to write our UI test. So the two, two sets of things we built in the first case that weren't unit tests, acceptance tests and contract tests, we're reusing them both now. Um, kind of. And we're not, I don't think we need to run both acceptance tests. Um, testing is all about confidence. And I now know that the use case exists on the service. And I don't, how many units, how many UI tests do I need to write? How many UI tests do I need to write that hit that service and then put the result of that service on the screen? If it's always just calling the method, and it's always displaying that array on the screen, I only need to run one UI test that checks that. If there were different services I was calling, if there's different variations on what data can come back, like it might be an array or null or an error, I'd want to write tests that cover all those eventualities, but I'm looking for a, you know, a subset. So let's take the one of the acceptance tests from the start, and I'm going to write a web test case. You could write a panther test case as well. It will the same approach would apply, it would just be slightly slower. Well, sorry, much slower, um, but it would be a real browser. So you might need to do that if you've got JS and stuff going on. And to start with, I can just copy in the um, acceptance test I had, because it's gonna be the same, we want a test that maps to the same sentence. And I think it's quite nice to just replace bit by bit, call it the same thing. Um, so how do I create a new order in a web context? I create the web client and I go to the order page. How do I add order items to the order? So what I'm doing as I'm writing these is I'm designing the UI and the routes. So I've just, had to, I've just made a decision about URLs. Now I'm making a decision about user interface. Is it a link? Let's make it a button. So ugh, I have to find the form and submit the form and say, I'd like a cheeseburger. Because that's repetitive, I'll hide that somewhere in a private method or on the test. If you're doing loads of this stuff, you might end up with um, lots of private methods on tests, and then you might make, decide to make them into public methods on helper objects. I have seen actually, um, as like Helisol was talking about, let me just go back. He, he did a talk where he talked about making the web 
making web implementation of the same service. So you'd have an order service with a create new method and then hidden inside that would be the web automation. I've not tried it yet. So we add all the items. We add all the items to the order, same as we did in the acceptance test, except we're going through the web. And we check the stuff is there. We do that by checking this stuff on the page. Um, so that's just the, the Symfony web test case language. Like I said, if you're using Panther test case, it'll run a real browser, but it's the same API or a superset of the API. So I'm reusing that thinking I did earlier. And now I have to implement the web interface because I've got one failing acceptance test run. Uh, and this will be running with the real database. So the first bit is it goes to this orders page. So I need to make an orders page. Um, the second, so once I do that, it'll stop complaining about the, the missing route. And then it'll start complaining. You've told me to click on buttons and there aren't any. So now I'm gonna cheat. Um, we're working on this adding, adding to your order feature. So I'm gonna assume that we've already built the menu. Uh, so I could just hard code it into my page. It would be getting it from a database somewhere. We built it last spring, you know. And it looks amazing, as you can tell. Um, maybe I should use Tailwind. <laughs> um, so what's going to happen now? The, the test is still going to be failing, but the message will have changed. It'll say, I click the button and it's submitted to somewhere that doesn't exist. So I have to write the page that the button submits to. And that's going to add an item to my order, right? And redirect back to the main page. So all in the same way as when I was doing the doctrine implementation, I was thinking about databases the whole time and not really thinking about tests or, or domain logic. Here, I want to mostly be thinking about web concerns. So how do I know which item to add to the data, add to the order? Let's make it so that it was submitted in the form. How do I know the ID of the order? Like tracking the idea of the order from request to request is a, is a sort of web concern. Let's say it's kept in the session. And then I do something in the middle and I send you back to the order. Now that's something in the middle. If only, this is where the magic happens, right? If only there was a simple way of creating an order if it didn't exist and adding an item to it. But wait, there is, there's a thing called orders service. And it has a method. If there wasn't an order in the session, I can call create new and save it in the session. And there's a method that adds an order, adds an item by ID, just by strings, adds an item to a specific order. That's not a coincidence. It's an artifact of the way we've built it. But it's very satisfying because I haven't had to solve any problems that aren't web problems like the, the Lego kit of stuff I need um, to build my UI, the, the domain logic's done. And it's like in a really convenient format. It's in a really convenient format because I started by writing a test, a service layer test. And the first thing I did, if you remember the first slide with code on, was making decisions about this API. And I, you know, being honest, Obviously, when you're writing code like this for a talk, you go back and refactor stuff. That's the one bit I didn't change. <laughs> the domain model changed a few times because I made it more and less complicated. But the, the decisions I made about what the service should look like pretty much stayed consistent. So now we've got an endpoint that adds an item to the order. The last bit is it, the order needs to be listed on the page. So when I get back to my boring static page, what do I need to add? I need to, if there's an order in the session, call list items. It's already got an array structure. It's different to the internal array structure. The service has an array structure it returns. Um, items there is, ignore that. <laughs> That's an artifact of a previous version. So we get the order ID from the session and we say list all the items in that order and pass it to Twig. 
it's pretty much a one-liner. All of the actions become one-liners in your service. So naturally they're available as one stateless one-liners in your controllers. So the things I'm doing to make it pass, I'm not doing any domain logic. I'm thinking about routing, I'm thinking about sessions, I'm thinking about forms, I'm writing. Um, oh God. I'm writing twig templates and ignore the third and fourth bullet points. And I'm sure you're wondering if it works. Of course it does. Beautiful. Watch out, just eat. Okay. So that's feature complete. Obviously, there's made, I mean, arguably there's some front-end improvement. But we've but we know that the things we talked to the business about were implemented in the core, and we know we've, we've got a high confidence level that the system as a whole supports them. I'm happy committing and sending it to a manual tester to find all the things, all the gaps and things we didn't talk about. So the top two rows, I've got these super fast PHP tests that I can run the whole time. The bottom two, I've got slightly slower tests that I probably only run when the infrastructure is available. They both run through Doctrine. They both involve a database. The end-to-end -end tests, if you had used Panther, would be much slower, but and they'd also involve, you know, web connections, that kind of thing. So that's kind of it. Let's recap. So for this specific kind of architecture, and remember other architectures are available, I start with acceptance tests at the service level to make sure the rules are implemented in the core. I TDD the fake infrastructure, and maybe when you're watching it felt a bit over the top, but then when we built the doctrine one, it was really handy to have had all those tests worked out in advance. That was point three. And then when building the UI tests, use the same acceptance test outlines as we did for the services. And magically, all of this stuff exists in your service layer, ready to be called from whatever UI you're using. The general points are start with acceptance test, start by talking to someone and try and make those conversations things that are easily processed into acceptance tests. Test at different levels in the stack. Um, testing the full stack isn't better because it's testing everything. It, it means that there's less control over. Yeah, think about how your tests are, enforce your architectural decisions. It means there's less control over how the tests are influencing the architecture. And that is it for me. Um, if you want to see the code, that's the URL.